Real good, a little bit about myself. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have been here since the hospital was first built. Um, I came here directly out of my training. Actually, a guy I graduated from high school with built this hospital. And uh, so I've, I've been around here and I've, I've got a lot of experience. And if you have questions about me, ask your friends because I've taken care of one of them, um, at least over a, over a period of time. Orthopedics is the care of the musculoskeletal system. I got a question a minute ago if we do other than hips and knees, and yes, I am in a group. Um, there are three of us, Dr. Burphy, Dr. Baker, and myself. Um, we're all orthopedic surgeons, and uh, our group is actually owned by the hospital. We are about a block south of here. If you turn into the bowling alley, everybody knows where the bowling alley is, and turn right, we share an entrance, but uh, we don't see patients in the bowling alley. We have a building just south of that. And uh, uh, as I say, she, as, as she just introduced, Sharon is my medical assistant and she can help you get appointments and so on. You can call anybody, but if, there, if you have something that's urgent or something, get a hold of us and we will help you out any way we can. Um, subject of my letter, lecture today, I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about arthritis and what it is and what we can do for it. And we have a thing in this hospital particularly that isn't available everywhere that, that is uh, uh, a particular advantage to patients. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. We're going to start out talking about osteoarthritis. There's arthritis by definition. Arth is joint. Okay, going back to the Latin roots, doctors you throw a lot of Latin around, but if you understand what the roots are, you'll understand a whole, about a whole lot about what we're talking about. Arth is joint, itis is inflammation, and inflammation of a joint is arthritis. There are a bunch of things that can cause it. You can have gout, which is little crystals. That's actually microscopic crystals. It's like throwing a sand in a bearing. I'll flare it up. Um, there's rheumatoid arthritis, there's traumatic arthritis where you have an injury, but 80 to 90 percent of the arthritis that occurs in our culture is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis has a bunch of synonyms, other names it goes by, wear and tear arthritis, age-related arthritis, um, and the dreaded word senile arthritis, but they're all the same things. So you'll hear them called by, di by different things, but if you come in and say, my shoulder hurts and my knee hurts, odds are very good you have osteoarthritis, and we'll just by history and maybe some labs and so on, we can figure out what it is um, if it's something else. But what we're going to talk about today, most of the things apply to any kind of arthritis. Now, with the exception of gout and maybe rheumatoid arthritis, those are kind of subspecialized things. And they respond almost exclusively to, um, excuse me, uh, to medical treatment. And so odds are good with those you're not going to need surgery if you see your medical doctor or your rheumatologist and get optimal management. I am a surgeon. That doesn't mean if you walk in my office, I am going to look for an excuse to cut you open. Um, I really believe that surgery is the solution of last resort. So if you come in and your internist or your family doctor hasn't already put you on an arthritis medicine or gotten you a little therapy or talked to you about some weight loss and gotten you to quit smoking, some things like that, we may have some other things to do before we actually get around to surgery. Um, osteoarthritis is a wear and tear process. What it is, is God made you so that you're always restoring things that break down. And sometimes our, the breakdown process out, outpaces the restoring process. Cartilage does not restore well. It doesn't have good circulation. If I open you up and I cut your cartilage, it doesn't bleed. And as you know, things that don't bleed don't heal well. Um, most of the nourishment that comes in the cartilage of your joints actually comes from your joint fluid. So making your joint fluid healthier actually can slow the progression of your arthritis. People think if, we, think if we put you on an arthritis pill, oh, that's just a painkiller, oh, it's just fooling your brain, make your brain think your knee doesn't hurt. But that generally is not true. If you're actually on an anti-inflammatory, on an effective dose, you're making your joint fluid healthier and you're actually slowing the progression of your arthritis. So that's a, a really worthwhile thing to do. Let's talk about a few of the other things that we can do um, 
to reduce arthritis, to reduce the pain of arthritis, to reduce the symptoms of arthritis, and to reduce the progression of arthritis. The number one thing you can do is stop smoking. If you already smoke, you're messing up. People think it's just your lungs. No, you're thinning out your bones, you're messing up the nutrition to your cartilage, um, you cut healing time, uh, nicotine is a peripheral vasoconstrictor. That means it shuts off some of the blood vessels to your arms and legs. And most of the surgery we do is on arms and legs. So if you smoke, you're compromising your circulation. You're markedly increasing your chance of uh, getting an infection. A lot of bad things about it. And so as she mentioned earlier, sometimes if you've got some other risk factors, that may be the tipping point. We just won't even do your surgery. If you're overweight and diabetic and a smoker, you're a really, really high risk. So you, if you want me to do everything I can for you, you kind of got to do everything you can for you or we're not on the same team. So before we undertake a major surgery, we're probably going to ask you to quit smoking. Um, weight loss, really important. Weight loss will accelerate the wear of your joints. It's, it's, I like to tell people if you're you're asking these small bearings to carry around your weight, that's fine, God designed them to do that. But if your body has gotten larger, I tell people, you, you have a, the, the analogy I used to use, I tell people, you're, you're a defective Volkswagen chassis and you're carrying around a Cadillac body, you're not gonna last. You're not gonna get the full 300,000 miles out of you. After 150,000 miles, we're gonna have to do some, some alignment work and some bearing work and that means your surgery. You can wear things out by being overweight. Um, some of the things you can do is modify activity. I see runners that are just raping their knees. Um, I think in God's original plan, I'm, I believe in the, the uh, original Garden of Eden, I think we walked around barefoot on grass. And instead we tromp around on concrete. All of our, in Florida, even our floors are concrete everywhere. Um, that's hard on your joints, that additional impact of, of not having that little bit of cushion. So just wearing cushioning shoes, not overdoing, you can do some modification of activities that can help you out. Um, say none of that works, you end up going to the doctor's office, we have a bunch of things that can help you. I briefly touched on anti-inflammatories. An anti-inflammatory will reduce the inflammation of your joint, it will make you feel, feel better, um, but it isn't just a painkiller, it actually knocks out the, and, and what you feel in arthritis, let's talk about that briefly. Not only does cartilage not have circulation, it doesn't have any nerves. You have no nerves in your cartilage. You have no nerves in your bone. You say my bones ache, that's a misnomer. You don't really ever have your bones ache. It's the tissues around your bones that your body have told you reflect what's going on in your bones, but in all honesty, you, if you can break a bone, if, you, if it doesn't move at all, it doesn't hurt. It's the stuff around it stretching and pulling that actually hurts. When you break a bone, it moves out of place. Yes, it wrenches the tissue around it and there, it, it hurts like the dickens. But coming back to a joint, you can have a really messed up cartilage. If you don't get an inflammatory response, you don't even know it. You can feel a little click or a little irregularity and that's all you feel. It isn't until the wear and tear products float around in the, jo in the joint fluid, irritate the lining of your knee. It's actually the irritated lining of your knee that hurts. That's what hurts in arthritis. Um, so if I give you an anti-inflammatory medicine, it may settle down the inflammation in the lining of your knee. It doesn't put your cartilage back. Nothing puts your cartilage back. Um, if you wear your cartilage out, there isn't anything. There's all kinds of quack cures. They've been going back to the medicine men that got on their carts pulled by the ponies and went across the West and sold you rheumatiz medicine, snake oil. Why, does, why did snake oil sell? Okay, because it's the nature of arthritis to get better and worse. And people always have some reason they did it. Well, I went 
husbands say she went shopping too much and flared her knee up or I went on a cruise and I walked a whole lot and we went up and down some hills in the Caribbean and, and that flared it up and that can overdo overdoing can flare it up but we all look for reasons sometimes there is no reason and it's kind of the nature that arthritis gets to get worse and worse and worse and then occasionally it'll get a lot better and if you were desperate and you spent too much money on medicine right here and you got better who gets the credit God time what was going to happen anyway no if you spent a whole bunch of money on it you give the credit to the medicine and so that's why there's a whole bunch of quack cures out there for arthritis and uh, I won't try to talk you out of them because some of them have actually a placebo effect the placebo effect means a th when, when we, if I give you sugar pills, if I charge you a little bit too much for them and I really endorse them and I tell them, oh, these are great, these are going to make you better, a third of people will get a bit better for a while. And that is called the placebo effect. And I hate to take that away. If somebody comes to me and says, does this work, doc? Yeah, I don't want to lie to you, but if you got a little bit better, enjoy that a little bit better. That's kind of okay. <laughs> um, Let's talk about the bad side of osteoarthritis, though. You get it, you try the anti-inflammatories, maybe your family doctor gives you a shot in the knee, doesn't settle it down, it still isn't doing good, you need to go see the surgeon. And so if you're in this town, you're probably going to see me or one of my partners, and you're going to come in and we say, what are our options? What are we going to do surgically for this? Um, 750,000 people in our country a year get their knees replaced. If you have a little bit of arthritis, let's go to our slides and, and we've got some illustrations here. These are the compartments of a knee and I'm going to talk more about knee than anything else but these can apply to other joints as well. In your knee you have a medial compartment, you have a lateral compartment, and you have a retropatellar that's behind the kneecap. What you can't see from this model is they've taken your kneecap off, but there's a little groove on the front of your knee that, that the kneecap rides in, right in the front. We can't talk about those as separate compartments in your knee, and they can individually wear out. Um, if they all three wear out, and you don't respond to the shots, and you don't respond to rest, and you don't respond to therapy or whatever we give you, then you're probably looking at a joint replacement. Go ahead. Um, a joint replacement is a big deal. Everybody here knows somebody or has a family member or a next door neighbor that had a joint replaced, and it's a big surgery. And I tell people minimum, it is a three month recovery period. It's a big incision. Why do we need a giant incision for, to replace a knee? Because we have to see everything. We have to get in there, spread things out, evert your kneecap, move it to the outside, cut off the back, and we replace all parts of your knee. Now, when, what a joint replacement is, I have some people come in that have this picture in your idea. We whack it off from here to here, and we replace this big hunk. It's this giant piece of metal. All joint replacements other than for cancer surgery and a few subspecialized things that only happen in universities, they don't happen in community hospitals, are resurfacing arthroplasties. We tell, only replace about a quarter inch of bone that has worn away. But we replace them with metal and plastic. And there's variations on stainless steel and titanium and polyethylene and the different plastics. And, and there's a few joints that are now done with, with uh, porcelain, done with, with uh, but in knees, it, there were a whole bunch of different kinds. They've been done for a long, long time. The first one was a simple hinge, and then they made it a little bit more complicated, and as time has gone on, they've gotten more and more like nature's original shape. Funny thing, don't know why we didn't tumble that right out when I say we, the scientists, and the people that went before me. Um, but when Dr. Insall back in the, I think it was the 40s or 50s, did the first joint replacements, it was just a hinge. It looks like a hinge, it works kind of like a hinge, and then we find out, no, it's a way more complex joint. And over time, we've made them more like regular joints, uh, like, like God's original, original joints, and we now have all three of those compartments in your knee, and we make them the shape. And one of the latest advantages, if you need a joint replacement and you come see me, I'm going to do a gender-specific knee. We now have knees that are shaped the size and shape of a woman and the size and shape of a man. Um, and we find they work a little bit better. Um, 
but those weren't available. At one, at one time, they kind of averaged them and, and everybody got an average size knee. Now we're getting a little bit more specific and there are lots of companies that make them and so on. Um, I, just, I happen to prefer the Zimmer brand um, because we have particularly good representatives that come and bring them. It's, it's, I like to tell people, there's, it does, what joint you get in this day and age, there's Lexuses and there's Mercedes and there's Infinities. They're a mechanical thing. How do you choose? If I, I kind of like a Lexus and I kind of like an Infinity, uh, but I really looked at an Acura, how do I choose which one I want? Oh, there's a dealership in my town that's really good that sells Lexuses. I'm going to drive a Lexus. There isn't that much difference between cars. They all have four wheels. They all work. They all get around. They all get fairly decent mileage. When you look at the, the differences, them are relatively subtle. And it's the same sort of thing with, with brands of joint replacements. The differences among them are relatively subtle. But I've got an experienced representative who brings the stuff in, makes sure we have the latest stuff, comes ahead of time, looks over all the equipment, makes sure when, we, when I walk into surgery, I can be worrying about you and not the equipment. That's the brand I use. I use the Zimmer brand. It doesn't mean it's better than anybody else's. It just means it's serviced well in this community. But for years and years, if you came into your, let's go on to the next one. Um, if you came in and your hand, oh, let's go, go back, I'm sorry. If you had this x-ray and you had worn out just one side of your knee, that's scraping bone on bone. There's no cartilage left. When we look at an x-ray, this isn't really space. That's cartilage. When you were 16 years old, it was about this thick. Then it's kind of worn down, and this one's worn completely away, and that hurts. Not only does that hurt, your leg is no longer in alignment. When, when this side got shorter and this side didn't, your ankle went over a little bit. This person is knock-kneed, okay? Once you get knock-kneed, all of the weight's going on this side that's already worn out, and uh, that's going to give you trouble. So one of the things we used to do is we'd do like a wedge osteotomy. We'd actually cut out a piece of bone, bring it down so that it, it brought your ankle over and all the weight was using the part of your knee that was good. Um, it's not done very much. It takes a year to get over that surgery. You have to wait for a bone to heal. It's a really big deal. Um, in my training period back 34, 35 years ago, we were just really getting into these and we we're perfecting them and we we're figuring out exactly the type of, type of wedge to do and so on. And I've done a few of them and you actually get good results, but it's a salvage procedure. It's to get you by, use the good part of your knee, it doesn't restore this, this is still bad and eventually this is going to wear out and you're going to need a total arthroplasty. So those are generally reserved for the 40 year old patient that we don't want to do a full total knee because it might not outlast you. Let's talk about how long do joints last. When I started, we told people, again, long time ago, you may get tired of hearing how old I am before this lecture is done, but we would tell people eight to 13 years on a knee. It's going to wear out. The plastic is going to wear out. It's going to loosen up. We put them in with cement. The cement may go, loosen up from your knee. We're going to have to go back in and redo something else. So. If you had more than that long to live, we figured, yeah, hey, we're going to have to do something else. This is not going to be your definitive surgery. As time has gone on, we've made the plastic so it doesn't wear out anymore. They actually irradiate it and cross-link it and they figured out scientifically just the right and the hardest to make plastic. If it's too hard, it cracks. If it's too soft, it wears. But they've made it just the right amount that it probably won't wear out in the next 40 to 50 years. And most of us in this room aren't going to have to worry about after 40 or 50 years. Um, We've figured out ways, one of, the, one of the bad things with joint replacements were you would, uh, your bone would grow away from it because it didn't have, bone needs stress to stay healthy. If you don't stress your bones, your bones aren't going to stay healthy. They're, you just sit on your butt and watch TV, your bones are going to thin out. Um, you need weight-bearing exercises to keep your bones going well. They discovered this when the astronauts first went up. I'm the son of a urologist, and so I was reading in the urology journal, these guys were all pee and calcium. When they first went up, just weightless, even before they were up there for a long period of time, 12 hours in a weightless environment just filled them with it. In the urology journals, they, were, they said all astronauts are going to uh, get kidney stones, which they didn't. 
they hydrated them enough, they kept enough fluid, they didn't get kidney stones. But the, the lesson out of this was if you don't stress your bones, so they now do isometric exercises. They have exercise devices that go into space with the astronauts to keep their bones relatively healthy. 12 hours of non-weight bearing, you start to flush calcium out of your system. The calcium is kind of the mortar in your bone. Um, and you don't want to do that because if you flush enough of it out, you break. Um, I got off on a... So, um, if, if we do this opening, uh, opening or closing wedge and let you use the rest of your knee, we could get you by until you're old enough to do a full total knee. A full, t nowadays, as we have perfected these, probably the current literature is saying 20 to 28 years, I think was the last number I saw. We're probably going to get really 35, 40 years out of total joints. Um, and note the probably I said, and we don't guarantee anything. I'm, I'm being video recorded, so I have to do the disclaimers. Um, but in all honesty, when I again, when I started practicing this hospital 30 years ago, one in three knees I did was revision. That means somebody had one done in New Jersey or Michigan 12 years ago. It wore out. It loosened up. I had to go back in and redo it. A redo doesn't do as well. It makes more scar tissue. You're much more likely to have pain. You're much more likely to have poor emotion. Um, revisions are rarely as good as, a, as the original one. So if we could do just one, that would be a good thing. We don't want to have to go back in there. Um, so we eliminated the cement. We made ingrowth components so your bone actually grows into the metal parts that passes the stresses on normally. It keeps the bone healthy underneath it. The bone quit dissolving away. We made plastic that didn't wear out. And now I do a revision about once a year, whereas I was doing them all the time. I'm doing lots more joint replacements, but the ones I'm putting in are outlasting the patients. Uh, the majority of joints we put in, and, and the, the cutoff years, I've watched it go early. We used to say, oh, if you're not 65, you can't have a joint replacement. Now we're saying 55 is ideal, but we fudge, and depending on, particularly if you're slender or something, you know, you're not going to, there are risk factors that you can do. If you're overweight, this 38-year knee is probably going to be a 15-year knee. And if you're overweight, you don't want to have 15 years from now when you're old and decrepit, you don't want another surgery. So we ask you lose weight before we do your joint replacement, hopefully. Um, if you're morbidly obese, if you're just a little overweight, it's hard to lose weight when you can't exercise. So if you'll promise me and I see some evidence, yeah, you're trying to lose weight, we might even if you're not ideal for that because you would wear it out, we can put your knee in and you can keep back, you can lose your weight much better after the knee than before. Um, when I was young and idealistic, I would sometimes refuse to do it and I found out they would go down into Tampa, get a lousy surgery and not, don't get me wrong, not all surgeries done in Tampa, but maybe it wasn't a good decision for that obese person to have it, have all kinds of complications. And I got all the complications. They showed up in our hospital when it fell apart or got infected or whatever horrible thing did. So I got a little less pragmatic about, about refusing to do it just because you're overweight. Um, okay, coming back to unicompartmental arthritis. Now, if you have just a little arthritis, we can do all these conservative things. We might even go with a scope. We might do an MRI on your knee. MRI lets us see little details that don't show up on the plain x-rays. We can see the cartilage. We can see the ligaments. And you may have a torn meniscus that's aggravating it. A meniscus is a little wedge-shaped washer in your knee. And we can go in with a scope, day surgery, put you to sleep, clean that out, put, fill you with numbing medicine, let you go home. Arthroscopy generally takes only about three weeks to get over it and get you, back to, get, get you back to life. But if you're down here to kissing bone on bone like this, an arthroscopy is not going to do you any good. If you have arthritis, advanced arthritis in even one compartment, if they've shown there's good stuff in the literature, there are still doctors that are doing arthroscopy for this, it doesn't help you. It's not a good idea. Let's go on. This is a little minor arthritis. That's, this is what normal cartilage looks like. This is a little bit of a torn ligament in knee. This is talking about sports injuries as, a, as an origin for, as a, a source for arthritis. Next. This is where you start get, get arthritis and inflammation in 
the side of your knee. This would be two compartment arthritis. Remember we talked about this is the retropatellar compartment. This would be medial. When I use the term medial, that means towards your other knee or towards the midline. You can always tell a knee picture, the, the little fibulas on the outside. So this is lateral, this is medial. So this is medial compartment, retropatellar compartment. This one is just unicompartmental, just the inside of your knee. And interestingly, about 80 to 85% of people who get one compartment disease in their knee uh, that's debilitating and requires surgery, it's the medial side. That one wears out. It has to do with the way our, that God made our shape. Your thigh bones are supposed to come at an angle. Your hips are, are farther apart. They have to be out from the outside of your pelvis. They come in at an angle and your shin bones are supposed to be straight up and down. And so that's a little bit of an angle. When that angle gets off, you wear quicker. Um, but you can see, see that angle? This, this comes in from the outside and this is supposed to be straight up and down. That angle gets off, you're going to wear your knee faster. Go ahead. This is late stage arthritis. This causes real pain. This causes severe debility. You'll notice you're having trouble climbing stairs. It hurts when I get up from a chair. It hurts when I try to get out of bed. And the worst thing, it hurts when I try to get off the toilet. That's what seems to be a thing that really aggravates knees. And if you have three compartment disease like this, nothing's really going to fix this other than a total knee arthroplasty. Go ahead. Um, I don't even know what this, this is a different set of slides than I'm used to. I don't know why this is saying 10% of you in compartmental is, is tibiofemoral, 24% I don't know what that number is. I'm sorry. Um, this is this is more what what fits my experience. 40 to 65 percent of osteoarthritis people show up saying that it's behind my kneecap. That's this uh, patellofemoral disease. Um, this is saying that the, the, that they also have some involvement of your medial compartment, and they often do, but you often don't feel it as much as you feel what's behind your kneecap. Um, and as this says, the most common thing we do, if you needed one knee, done, one compartment done, we replace the whole knee. Why did we do that? This is an important part. Everybody knows people that had a unicompartmental knee. That means they replaced half of your knee and they're happy with them. Most people know someone who had a unicompartmental knee who are unhappy with them. So we look back at knees. When we look at total knees, almost 90% of people, the last number I saw was 89% of people get good to excellent results. Excellent means, I don't remember what knee it was, it feels like I was 20 years ago old. Good means, eh, I can feel a little bit, but I can still do anything I want. I'm back out on the golf course, I can ride my bicycle, I can go shopping with my wife. Um, I can do the things I need to do. That's a good result. I can still tell a little bit, but it doesn't stop me from doing anything. Um, with unicompartmental knees, if you wore out just one or two compartments of your knee and they replace, and there have, been, there have been ways to do that for a long time, one in three of them failed. That means you were back in the operating room within three years. That's a bad number. I don't like that number. And so every time a new unicompartmental knee would come out, I'd go do the training course and I'd look at them and I'd look for a patient that just had unicompartmental disease. And uh, then the numbers would start to come out. And I said, oh no, even this new one, one in three of them, they wore out, they loosened up, they had problems, they had to go back in. And when you go back in, you end up doing the full total knee anyway. Well, if I tell a patient, if I consent you properly and I tell you what's coming and I, I pride myself in letting people know what's coming, we tell you a total knee's gonna hurt like the dickens. It's a very painful operation. Once you get over it, you're gonna be really happy. But, um, when you're going through it, it's a very painful operation. If I tell you if I put a unicompartmental knee and there's a one in three chance it's going to go back and go bad and you're going to have to put the full total knee in, most people say, can't you just do the full total knee now? Yeah. And so everybody ended up with total knees. So unicompartmentals were not very common in our country. We still did a, we, I did very few of them. Some orthopedists tended to push them. I have a partner, I have a friend that I, I know from way back, I go do mission duty with him, and he, he found this knee that he really liked. It's called an Oxford knee, and he had me go do the course with him and stuff. And he found a lot of people that did them. 
and they started coming apart. And he says, oh, I'm sorry I talked you into that. And I was glad I hadn't done very many of them. Let's go on. This is talking about the, the conservative things you can do to try to settle down your knee, particularly if you don't need the full total knee. Go ahead. Um, this is, talks about the problems of doing a total knee. If you need a total knee, get it, okay? There used to be this philosophy, put it off as long as you can. And there are still family practice doctors and primary care doctors in this town that are still saying that. Put it off as long as you can. Don't believe that, okay? I underwent, and, and when I started practice, I did that. I'd see people, let's try the shots, let's try all the conservative things, put it off as long as you can. I have changed my philosophy, and the thing that made me change my philosophy is we can now put one in that will probably outlast you. So once you have a painful knee that doesn't respond to the conservative things, whether you need a unicompartmental knee or whether you need a full total knee, if you need the surgery on it, if we can do a surgery that will outlast you, I have now subscribed to what I call the shiny car philosophy. You buy a car, it has paint, the paint fades. After a while, the car gets so ugly that you're embarrassed. You don't park out in front of church, you park behind. You don't park out in front of your friend's house when you go to the party, you park two doors down. Um, because you're a little embarrassed. It still runs. You can get there. It's just kind of an embarrassment because this car looks like, mm. and you go price. What does it cost? They have $1,800 just to put a new layer of paint on. It's expensive. It's, uh, oh, and I have to do without my car for a whole week? And so you put it off and you put it off and you put it off. And then you go to try to sell a car and you find out no one will buy this car. It's ugly. I'm going to have to paint this car. The car still has a good engine. It's still going to run for many more years. But my wife demands a new car. And so I'm going to, say, I'm going to have to sell this car. I'm going to have to paint this car. So I shell out the 1800 bucks. I do without the, without the car for a week. And the next guy gets the shiny car. If I'd done it five years ago, I'd have had the shiny car. So it's the same sort of thing with total knees. Now that total knees and total hips and, and joint replacements will outlast you, don't put it off. Once the, the decision when to make, when to have a, a joint replacement surgery is something that you can't make yourself, your surgeon can't make yourself. You have to look at your circumstances and your life and what's going on around you and so on. It's a complex decision. But the basic thing is once it's inevitable get it done. Once it's inevitable and you're of an age that it will probably outlast. Now, if you're 19 years old, that's a different thing, okay? But once you're 55, which I think most of us in the room are, with only, I only see two people that I think are exceptions. Um, once it's inevitable and you're of an age, go ahead and get it done. Find a convenient time and get it done. Don't wait till you're in a wheelchair. Don't wait till your muscles have given out. Don't wait till you're really, really debilitated. Um, and once it's all over, you're probably going to have a good knee for the rest of your life. You enjoy the shiny car. Why do, are people reluctant about total knee arthroplasties? I saw a number about a year ago that said, Dr. Insall was the father, mother, father of total knees, uh, he had a partner named Dr. Bernstein, and one of the first knees I put in were called Insol Bernstein knees. They had pioneered them. They, were, um, um, they lasted a long time. They got 15 years out of them. Um, nowadays, we get a lot more out of them. But the thing we haven't improved is we have to see your whole knee to put it in. To avoid cutting the fancy nerve in the back of your knee or the artery in the back of your knee, we have to see where we are. So we make this big old long incision we have to move your kneecap to the outside. Um, it works, it does great, but it hurts afterwards. We've done all kinds, we put little catheters that drip numbing medicine in your knee and we put shots in your knee and we give you narcotics and we put you in the hospital and we put you on a little machine that makes your knee bend back and forth so you don't get too stiff. We get you therapy twice a day, but it's a big thing and it's gonna hurt. Um, if you need it, you need it, you should do it. I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but because everybody knows somebody that went through it, 80% of people who should have a total knee are gonna say, no, I don't wanna go through that. 
my neighbor Bob, he had a total knee and he's still hurting two months later. I don't want to go through that. So people that should have joint replacements oftentimes put it off. It requires a bunch of rehabilitation. Um, it, it takes away a lot. And so to do a full total knee for somebody that needed a partial knee, I always felt a little guilty about that. I've done literally thousands of them. If you came into my office eight years ago and you needed a partial knee, after I consented, you'd say, let's do the whole knee, doc. Let's do the full total knee. Or you might say, I don't want a full total knee. My neighbor Bob had one and it hurt him too much and I'm just going to put up with this. So we looked for solutions for these partial joint replacements. And what they did, the scientists did, I'd like to take credit for it, but they took the ones that failed. They took the x-rays, they took the original x-rays, they took the operative x-rays, they took the failure x-rays, and they sent them clear across the country with people that didn't know the surgeon, they didn't know the patient, they, didn't, they just looked at the x-rays, and they measured, and they cogitated, and they thought about it, and they said, they're not putting these in right. The ones that failed weren't put in with the right precision. They might be a little too high, the slope might be a little bit wrong, and the analogy I like to use, again, I use mechanical things because we've all replaced cars and so on, and it's a thing you have done. For all, probably none of you have had your joints replaced yet. If, you re if one tire wears out on your car and you replace that one tire, what's going to happen? It's going to wear out again because you didn't get an alignment job. If you don't get an alignment job and you just replace that one tire, there was something that made it wear out. Well, we figured out we weren't doing the right alignment. And when I say we, everybody that did unicompartmental knees, nobody had this better than one in three failure rate. There were people that bragged about, oh, our failure rate was not that bad. And they went and they traced and they said, no, you're doing people from out of town. You're not seeing your own failures. Um, when they looked at it, it was just universally one in three. And so they figured out we're not putting them in quite right. Well, it wasn't because the surgeon wasn't doing the best job he could. We found out that our equipment wasn't precise enough. When I put in your artificial knee and I cut away that little quarter inch of bone, I use a little oscillating saw. And the blade has a little bend and it wanders off a millimeter. Or we lose, we, we get it a half a degree off or maybe even two. You can get it two degrees off and a total knee works great because the knee is all one block. When you, we put a block on the tibia and a block on the femur, and it's, it has good internal alignment with itself. It was made in a factory on a precise, very precision machine. I've gone and toured those factories. Fabulous equipment, make really, really nice pieces. But if we get your knee off just a degree or so with a total knee, there's lots of variation. You look at people, if I had you all stand up, a bunch of you'd be knock kneed bow-legged, all kinds of stuff. It tolerates it, but if you're trying to replace just one part and throwing it on the other, what happened was we wore out the other side or we put too much stress on it, loosened up. So somebody said, we got to have a better way to do this. And they came up with a robotic system for replacing knees. Well, my hospital asked me to go investigate it. And I says, uh-uh, I don't want a robot, robot doing my surgery. Surgery is the most fun part of my week. I love doing surgery. I don't want some robot doing my surgery. So I went and investigated, it's gone. And I found out, this just talks about, we needed something for somebody that's beyond an arthroscopy that can have your cartilage smooth before needing the full total joint replacement. This is showing what we cut away with a saw right there. People with one and two compartment disease, go on. Um, this shows how we make the cuts we take a little saw, we put a jig on there, we pin it, we align it, we put a pin down the center of the bone to, to, and, and then we put this saw in it and then that saw blade wanders just a little bit. Your bone's pretty tough stuff. And if you put this long skinny blade in there, it can be off a little bit. In the most, it doesn't matter how experienced the surgeon was, we weren't providing the surgeons with the tools that would do it with their precision. So some smart guy, go ahead, decided uh, let's go ahead, go ahead. Somebody came up with this robotic interactive orthopedic system. And what that robot does is guide the surgeon. It's like a real precision guide. And they figured out 
these saws aren't doing it right. We need to change what we do. So they figured out we can get more precision with a high speed burr. This is very much like a little Dremel Moto tool. It's a little six millimeter burr and we do all the resection for this robotic surgery with a, with a high speed burr instead of using the saw. And the thing that it actually does that guides you, let's see if it shows us a picture of this. Okay, um, I'll, come, I'll come back to that in a minute as I catch up with the slides. We, they came up with a system that would replace just part of the knee. Put a resurfacing, this is only about uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, a nice stainless steel plate on that, a titanium plate here, a polyethylene plate here, but use your native knee for the rest of it and only replace that part. You could do the outside of the knee, uh, excuse me, the medial side, or inside, the, the lateral side. You can put a plate on the back side of the patella, right, where, where your uh, kneecap is wearing and we'll put a little plastic button on the back side of the kneecap, or if you even need to, if you have the inside, uh, inside worn out, you can, you can do them, and you can do these individually. Now, if you need all three, there's no point. You still should have the totally arthroplasty. Go ahead. This is what the robotic system is. This is the actual instruments. We have them in our hospital. Not every place has them. Uh, when we first got them, we had an exclusive on them so that we were the only place. There are now some other, I think there's one in Tampa. Not, did Lakeland get one? Lakeland has one now. So they're out there. We are not the only place you can get this anymore. Um, but it's a three component system. This is a computer. Before you come in, if you need just one half of your, one part of your knee replaced, we send you to get a CAT scan because the computer needs to know all of the details of your bone. We don't charge you for this CAT scan. It isn't another thousand bucks on top. The hospital eats the cost of that or, or anything that you have left over after insurance anyway. Um, because we're not sending the radiologist to have it read. We're actually sending it to this computer. And in this computer, we can plan your surgery. Then, this, these are little sensors that can see things. When you come to surgery, we put pins in your leg after your sleep. Um, we put pins in your thigh and pins in your tibia and we hook reflectors to them and we can move your leg around and your, the, this thing is looking at it and it figures out exactly where the center, and we rotate your hip, it figures out exactly within a millimeter where the center of your hip is. And, it figure, and when we take a little wand with reflectors on and we touch your ankle and it figures exactly within a millimeter or so where, where your ankle is. And then when we get in your knee, we actually touch the cartilage and the bone in there, again with a little wand with reflectors on it, and it gets down the precision down to within a half a millimeter. You know, how, you know how thin a millimeter is, with a half a millimeter or a half a degree of slope. Then we put, go ahead. Then we figure out, this is the computer picture, and we put the prosthesis actually in the computer, and we can move your leg around and see what it's going to do. And we say, oh no, that's going to be too tight. That's going to be the one in three that would have failed, or that's the wrong slope. And we move it around in the computer. We may spend anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes in the operating room redoing your prosthesis and change the size and change the slope and so on. And then we move your leg around and see how it's going to work and say, nope, that's not right. Okay, and when we're all done, we can tell exactly how much pressure there's going to be in the knee. This is the alignment job. And we do the alignment job in the computer. You don't want us doing it in you. You don't want to take it out and remove it and change it around. Once we put a piece in, it's kind of there. We don't have a good way to move it around. Then, once we figured out where it should be within a half a millimeter of precision, how do we put it in with that precision? And that's when the robotic arm comes in. This is the actual robotic arm. This is the surgeon. And it's the surgeon still moving that thing back and forth. And you can see this little high speed burr. It interacts with the computer and we can actually see what we're cutting away in the bone. The green, basically we take the green part away and when we get to near the edge of what we're trying to cut, it puts on brakes. That's all it does is it just stops you from going from out where. Now if I had a trip or sneeze or something and I've got it in your knee and I try to plunge it, it shuts it off. If I try to go back in the back and get that artery or that vein that I talked about making that big incision to have to avoid, it won't let me. And it's, it's a really reliable system. The first few times I did it, I was kind of afraid of it. But now I have a lot of faith in it. And so I can cut behind your knee back here and not even see it.
because I can see on the computer exactly, you can see where the burr is, you can see the green that's going away and see where it takes it away. And when we're all done, we have a bed that, that accepts the component in the perfect size, in the perfect place. We put that in your knee, and because we're working with just one little thing instead of a big saw blade and a bunch of jigs, we do it through a small hole. We do make an incision about this big in the front of your knee. And we can align that in line with the fibers of your knee. For a total knee, we do it the whole length of your knee. We move the kneecap to the outside. We sew it back. Every time you knee, it's when you move your knee after that, which you've got to do, it's pulling on that. That's what causes all the pain. The actual prosthesis doesn't hurt. Again, it's laying on bone, has no nerves. It's made of metal, has no nerves. It's the stuff around it, the stretching and pulling and so on that causes your pain. Because we can do this through a small incision, because we don't have to visualize everything with my eyeball, I can see a lot of what I'm doing on the computer. We can do it through a small incision. Because of that, we found out these people can go home. We do this as a day surgery. We fill you with numbing medicine. We tell you it's going to be sore the next day. But it hurts about like an arthroscopy. I mean, you, all of you have known people who have an arthroscopy. That everybody's done day surgery for years. And it hurts a little bit the next day when your numbing medicine wears off. Um, we give you some narcotic pain pills to take. We have a therapist come visit you, teach you some exercises to do on your own. And you increase activity as tolerated. Once we put this in, it's as strong as it's ever going to be. We have no restriction on your activity. You can get back to what you feel like you can do. Now, most people lay around for a week and don't do a whole lot. And we ask you to push a little bit um, to keep it from getting stiff and so on. Um, but you can do what you feel like you can do, and you're not going to damage it. That's a real major advance. With to other total joints, we have these restrictions on you, and we say, okay, after two months you can do this, and you can't drive for this. With this, as soon as you're not taking the narcotic pain pills, you can drive. Um, as soon as you feel like you can do something, you can do it. I had one guy played a full round of golf five days after, after a unicompartmental knee like this. Now, that's an exception. Don't plan on that. Um, he was just a tough guy, and he, he was doing this to get back out on the golf course, and he said by the end of his 18 holes, it was sore. Get by with sore, that's pretty good. He said, he said but not as sore as my arthritis was. So he'd been hurting bad before he got around to getting it done. Okay, let's go on. Um, this just shows the CAT scan images that we put in. It makes a 3D image of it. Um, because this is patient specific, it's looking at your CAT scan. In the past, we, with a uh, total joint, we just kind of measure how wide it is and how thick it is and get, it, get one that's approximately the right size. And it works. That works great. But for a unicompartmental, we found out we needed more precision. And this, this system allows us to give it that more precision. Go ahead. Um, this is the planning thing for the plate that goes on top of your tibia, and we can, I, I would say that one's a little bit small, we'd put a little bit bigger one in, we want it to cover your, uh, cover your joint a little bit better, um, and, but we can look at it from all different angles, and in the computer we can, we can move it all around and look at it from here, and before, before we do your surgery I do that, we look at all around it and look at it from all different directions. Go ahead. Then uh, this shows uh, doing the femur. This is the plan that we have. This is, this is the computer picture that a lot of times I'm not actually looking in your knee. I'm looking at the computer. That's why we can do it through a little hole. It's, we're working like this and watching what we're doing over there. And uh, if it loses the picture, if something goes wrong, everything shuts off. It stops. So we can't be messing our things up in there. Go ahead. This is an actual picture of a knee. That's a kneecap. This would be your hip up here, ankle down here, the surgeon's hand. Uh, the little plastic thing is just part of the way we, we preserve the sterility of the sterile arm. We just put a, a sterile plastic sleeve over it. But we're working in there, and you can see they're working way in the back of the knee and uh, not having to see what you're doing. Go ahead. Because of that, we don't lose as much blood. Um, a big part of the pain of a, total, of a total knee is we put a big tourniquet on your leg to keep it from bleeding too much. This surgery is, is quick enough and non-invasive enough we don't use the tourniquet anymore. And tourniquets hurt. A big part of the pain you have afterwards is ischemic pain from not having enough circulation to your leg for a while and the actual mechanical pressure. It'll, people end up with big bruises from, from the tourniquet with a total, total knee and we don't have to use that anymore. So we're seeing in real time 
we get the implant position um, and we see how it's going to actually work in your knee and then this lets us put us in with great precision. Go ahead. Um, this is just showing, this is a magnified view. This, that thing is only four millimeters thick with a six millimeter ball on the end. Go ahead. Um, this is what it looks like on an x-ray. This is a stainless steel piece that we cement in place. This is, a, this is actually an older one. Uh, we now put it, the original ones were just plastic. We now put a titanium plate under that and clip the plastic into it. Go ahead. Um, and this is actually what it looks like. This is a titanium plate, this is a stainless steel piece, and this is polyethylene. It's the same stuff that my other joints that I've been using for years. It's similar uh, materials. And it's very similar to some other unit compartmental knees. The thing that makes this a difference is the alignment job that the robotic surgery lets us do. So <clears throat> I was approached by one of the finance guys in our hospital. He was actually the vice president in charge of finance. He knew somebody that was doing this out in California at one of our sister hospitals in, in uh, Angwin, California. And he says, this is making people happy. Knight, you got to go learn how to do this. And I'm the one that said, nah, I don't want some robot doing my surgery. Just go to a meeting, look at it. So I went to the meeting. I looked at it. We have what we call sawbones. They're actually made out of plastic foam. And I did the surgery on a, a fake, fake bone. And I said, oh, this is just, I do a little woodwork. This is like, I can do, I can frame a house with a skill saw. I don't make furniture with a skill saw. It doesn't do with the precision. If I'm going to make furniture, I want, you can tell I'm an equipment nut, I want a Beismeyer uh, rip fence on a fine precision cabinet maker saw. It's, it's the same sort of thing. This is just a really fine piece of equipment that lets me as a surgeon do more precision work in your body. Um, it isn't that a robot's going to come do your surgery. I'm still going to see you every day and, and take care of you. Um, I said, I'm intrigued by this. Let me talk to somebody who's done somebody. They hooked me up with a guy down in Naples. Um, turns out his father helped develop the system. He'd done more than just about anybody around. I went and did some with him. I said, I like this. Let's get on board. When the time came for us to make the transition to buy the million dollar machine uh, that the hospital was going to invest in, make sure we're really going to use this. We don't want one that just sits in the back closet because uh, it is a major investment. They don't charge you a million dollars. They, uh, all the, it's amortized out. And actually, uh, just to answer that question before it comes up, there are a few places, these cost a little bit more than, than other knees. And there are some places that charge you a premium and make you pay cash up front. I said, I don't want to do this. The hospital said, we won't. We will do it for whatever it takes. And actually, the first ones we put in, they lost money on. Actually, a considerable amount of money. And I said, are you sure you want to keep doing this? You're losing money on it. And the hospital said, you would not believe how happy these people are. They're coming into us and say, thank you for providing us, Dr. Knight, and, and Dr. Baker and Dr. Murphy do these too. The, thank you for providing us these good doctors that did this great surgery. These are the happiest patients I've ever had because it is so simple and your recovery is so quick and you get back to functions uh, and it's just a lot easier. So we were gonna go down to Fort Myers and, uh, excuse me, to Naples and I took the whole team. I want the OR supervisor, I want my assistant, I want the physical therapist. We're all gonna figure out how we're gonna do this thing because physical therapists used to seeing you 10 times before you leave the hospital. I said, you can see them once, teach them, some, teach them how to get around up and down some stairs, make sure you can do this, and then they're going to go out the door that day. You're going to have to see them in recovery. They said, we've never done that. So I said, well, let's go find out how they've been doing it. Where they were. So we took the team down. We took the hospital van down. I said, do we have a spare seat in the hospital van? And they said, yeah, we got, we got room for two or three more people. They said, who do you want to take? I said, I want to take a guest. And they said, a guest? Oh, OK. They're used to me being a little eccentric, so OK. So came up, we showed up that morning to take the trip down. I brought my dad. My dad's 90 years old. My dad's bow-legged as a dickens. He's always been bow-legged. And my dad's on a walker, and he grunts every step he takes. 
So we went down there, we went in, we all did the surgery, and we learned all the stuff and we gathered all our materials and we're going through the checklists at the end of the day. And I said, Dr. Beekle, would you take a look at this gentleman over here? And my dad got up and he said, let me see a walk. He got up with a walker and he kind of hobbled along and he said, well, I'd need to see some x-rays. I said, you mean these? And I was trying to get a free consult. You know how people are. I have people bring their x-rays to church once in a while. <laughs> anyway. He looked at these x-rays and he says, yeah, he's a good candidate for them. In about 20 minutes, we had him scheduled for surgery and we didn't do it that day. I took him back down because he was 90. They said, oh, we don't want to do them both at once. We'll put him up a little bit apart. Because he's 90, we'll probably keep him in the hospital overnight. So I took him down there. He hobbled in with his walker. He went in, he had his surgery. About three o'clock in the afternoon, they said, would you come back in here? He's flirting with the nurses. He's walking around. He's eating. He's peeing. He's doing all the things he needs to do. He says, I want out of here. And uh, so he says, we probably are going to have trouble keeping him. And I says, no problem. So we put him in the car, ran by Eckerd's and bought a pack of ice to put on his knee on the way home. And we're driving, <clears throat> driving home. And uh, I go to pull in our development. My, my, my mom's 87, my dad's eight, uh, 90, and I live next door to him. We kind of look out for him. And, and uh, he says, no, no, don't go in there. I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to Manolo's. We're having a party. I said, what? He's been, I gave him an iPhone a while back, and I thought he was playing solitaire. He was texting his friends and calling them. There was a bunch of people at Manolo's waiting for us. He had a party the day of his surgery. And uh, we still had the numbing medicine. He felt good. He hobbled in with a cane. He wasn't going to use his walker. Took him back a couple weeks later. He walked in with a cane. He walked out with nothing. And he uses no walking aids. He walks fine. Um, he's got a little bit of a back problem. He's, you know, he's, he's now 92. This is a couple years ago. Um, but he goes and walks in the neighborhood. He goes out and helps other people. And, and uh, he doesn't use any walking aid anymore. So uh, if people say, that's one of the questions, would you do this on a family member? Yes, I did. I had it done. I had Dr. Beekle do it. I didn't do a surgery. You shouldn't be doing major surgery on your own family member if you can avoid it. But I really believe in this. I'm really happy with what it does for my patients. And as I say, they're the happiest patients I have. So uh, it really works. Now, I didn't touch on hip. There is, there is a system for doing hips. One of the things that go wrong with hips, as a matter of fact, the number one complication of hips is dislocation. Everybody knows somebody that had a hip and a thing popped out of joint. They bent over wrong or they're, you know, they, they, I call it poodle disease. Oh, foo-foo, pop. They bend over when they're not supposed to and they pop the knee out of the thing. Or getting up off a toilet or getting out of bed. One of the things that aggravates, um, that makes you more likely to dislocate a hip is the position of the socket. And we try, we, there have been all kinds of things that, that we try to position the socket. And I have a very low dislocation rate. I'm one of the more experienced joint replacement surgeons, partially because of age and partially because I live in a geriatric community where a lot of people need joint replacements. I'm the, probably the most experienced joint replacement surgeon in this county. Uh, and over time, I've had a very, very low dislocation rate. But every so often, I have somebody that ooh, this hip doesn't look right. This is going to be difficult. Oh, it's a funny position to start with. And this robotic system has a way of putting the socket in. And it can put it in with great precision. Once again, we can do a CAT scan. We can plan it ahead. So if you have a problem hip, we can use this robotic surgery to put your socket in in just the right position and, and decrease your chance of a dislocation. So they're expanding what they're able to do with the system. It's, their, um, it's not experimental by any ch stretch of the imagination. There are thousands of them across the country. They're not in every hospital. Not everybody's doing them. Not everybody's experienced with them. But this hospital, because of the foresight of one of our financial guys, who has since moved up and he's now our chief operating officer in this hospital, um, he had the foresight and the insight to say, this is going to help the citizens of this town. And, we, and we're able to do that. Does so. an x-ray, just an x-ray show if it's just compartmentalized or just, what does an, how much does an x-ray show? An x-ray will give you a good idea, um, but it isn't the whole answer. You need an examination too. We need to see, um, I need to put hands on your actual joint and see how loose it is, where it hurts. Um, what can be done with conservative things. Now, I've put some in with a patient that had a little bit of arthritis on the other side, and I tell them, 
they come in and they hurt all over and I put you on an anti-inflammatory and it all settles down except this one side hurts. I tell them, if I replace this one side, you're still gonna need the anti-inflammatory to keep the rest of your knee settled down. And they say, that's fine, that's worth it. I'll let you do that, I don't want, a full, don't want the full total knee. And I just tell them, you're, gonna, you're still gonna need some medication beyond that. See, medicine's fine. If, if you can get by with a day surgery instead of having to stay in the hospital and maybe go to rehab, and it's worth doing. So it's a judgment thing. You want an experienced person figuring out if you need this. Yes? Um, I think I might have gotten a little confused. OK. I gave you lots of information, and we expect that. Um, well, I, I kind of exist in a state of overwhelm anyway. OK. So <laughs> um, now the unicum Compartmental. That is the one that's like a day surgery. It's a partial knee, basically. Correct. Right. Yes. Now, uh, and so the 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 total knee is the. A total knee is when we do all knee. three compartments and at once. And it hurts like crazy. And yeah. And takes forever to get well and all that. Not forever. Well, three months, on average. Okay. Uh, um, Don't discourage the people who really need it. What do you mean? If you didn't discourage anybody with what you just said, <laughs> with reality, then nothing else is going to discourage you. Well, I, I want Don't people... Don't blame me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm not, I didn't bring the act. One, one of the reasons I tend to have happy patients and satisfied patients, and one thing I think I do well, before I got crazy and took medicine, God had to beat me on the head to get me in medical school. My dad's a physician, and my grandfather was a physician, his uncles were physicians. They were never home. I was not going to do this thing. I was going to go have a happy life and have summers off. I was going to be a biology teacher. And uh, <clears throat> God did, Long story, bunch of miracles involved. God beat me on the head and put me in medical school instead. And uh, I'm, I see why now, and I'm happy, and I'm delighted I do this. But um, I try to explain things. And if you know what's coming after surgery, it's not too bad. If I tell you, oh, this is a piece of cake, and then you hurt, you think something went wrong. If I tell you it's going to hurt like the Dickens, and it hurts like the Dickens, you say, oh, yeah, I kind of expected this. He told me it's going to go away in a little while. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Mm-hmm.